The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the wedding. When the, ri- when the wine ran short, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, how does your concern affect me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servers, do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone jars there for Jewish ceremonial washings each holding 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus told them, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, draw some out and take it to the head waiter. So they took it. And when the head waiter tasted the water that had become wine without knowing where it came from, although the servers who had drawn the water knew, the head waiter called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves good wine first, and then when people have drunken freely, an inferior one, but you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this as the beginning of his signs in Cana, in Galilee, and so revealed his glory and his disciples began to believe in him. The Gospel of the Lord. I invite you to be seated. What a gift and privilege it is for all of us to be here together. You may or may not know, but on the day of a wedding, it's the prerogative of the couple to pick the readings for the wedding. Now, in my seven years of being a cleric, I've probably done maybe a hundred weddings and have never had a couple pick your first reading from the Book of Kings of Solomon asking for wisdom. This is an incredibly beautiful reading in which the Lord says, whatever you want me to do for you, ask. Have we ever allowed the Lord to ask us what we would want him to do for us? I think sometimes it'd be lovely to say, Lord, if, I could, if you could just add a zero to my bank account, that would be lovely. Lord, if you could just off my boss, that would be lovely. Lord, if you could just take care of the problems of my life, that would be lovely. And here Solomon asks for wisdom. And the gift of wisdom is nothing other than to see things the way God sees them. If God is the creator of all that is, if he knows the molecular intricacies of every facet of his creation, then to begin to have the vision of God is to live as if he's the source of creation, is to live as if he's the source of blessing, as if he is the source of all that is good. And then we begin to see ourselves as the goodness of his creation. We see then in the responsorial psalm, blessed are all those who fear the Lord. Fear of the Lord happens all throughout sacred scripture, and it's one of the most misunderstood phrases in all of scripture. Fear of the Lord is not this Lord don't hurt me kind of fear. There are three types of fear. Mundane fear is the fear of losing something pleasurable. It's what two, three, and four-year-olds go through when they're told to share. 
If I give up this thing that I have, I'm afraid I won't get it back. It's also what adults do when someone says, hey, do you have a minute or can you help me? We fear, oh no, what is this going to cost me? Then there's servile fear. It's a fear of being punished. This is also not the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is a filial fear and it's deeply related to holy matrimony. A filial fear is the fear that sets in the heart of a child when he or she is lost from his or her mom or dad in a grocery store. That's the moment where the child could say, I'm free and just walk out into the public. But that fear in a properly ordered child says, what can I do without my mom or dad? And so the fear keeps the child in place, makes the child desperate to find his or her mom or dad again. So too, that fear instilled in the heart of a believer says, who am I without God? Again, if we see things the way God sees them, then we see how dependent we are on God as the source of providence, on God as the source of all that is good. And this is a beautiful thing that sets me free because now I'm no longer the source of all that is good. I don't need to produce goodness for myself. Following in God's ways, I can follow him who is the source of good. It's also related to holy matrimony because filial fear, the fear of a son or daughter, is also the fear of a lover. When some facet of separation enters into a marital relationship, maybe an emotional strain, a time of grief, even a time of temptation, it's this filial type of fear that says, I don't want to do anything that risks the heart of my beloved. And it's this beautiful fear that keeps us faithful to the commitments and promises that we have made before God, that we have entrusted our hearts to our beloved. And then from this reading of Corinthians, love is patient, love is kind, is perhaps one of the most convicting examinations of conscience for each of us. We all want to say, oh, I love and you love and he loves and she loves. But is our love patient? Is our love kind? Does our our love bear the faults of others well? Is your spouse a safe place for you to learn to overcome your selfishness? You see, holy matrimony is supposed to be the safest place for your heart to reside this side of heaven. All of your mistakes, everything you don't like about yourself, even your moral faults and sins, are all supposed to have a safe place within a shrine of mercy within holy matrimony. And what you are about to do here on the steps of this altar is to profess, you're not perfect and I am not perfect, but we will depend on the love of God to give us what we need, to lead us day by day to see things the way God sees them. From the gospel, Jesus' first miracle in which the gospel says, This is the very place where Jesus reveals his glory, is at a wedding with copious amounts of wine. (laughs) Hopefully we'll be falling in suit tonight. But the beauty of this is this is a moment, my friends. Think of the days before credit cards. 
A family had to save up wine for years that was to be used at a wedding, and for it to run short was a mark of extreme embarrassment. And what is Jesus' first miracle? To save face for a couple on the day of their wedding. How beautiful then that Mary, the mother of God, that Jesus himself and his apostles were invited to this wedding. And in so doing, he was able to provide for what was lacking. Since then, for the both of you, for myself, and for anyone here who is honest, our love isn't always patient and our love isn't always kind. Which is why we will hear shortly in the nuptial blessing, pour your love, Lord, into our hearts. Because our love, like the wine at the wedding feast of Cana, sometimes runs short. And how beautiful that if we see things the way God sees them, that he is good. He is the source of love, the source of wine, and the source of everything else that is pleasant and good for us. Then preferring God to everything else, preferring the creator to creation, we're actually freed up to be wherever we are, and to allow the Lord's providence to rule in our hearts. This wedding is happening far away from home for pretty much every one of us except maybe the florist. (laughs) And yet there's beautiful symbolism. It's a very specific tenant of Christian thought to view this life as we are away from home and journeying back to where we belong, next to the heart of our Lord in heaven. And so Christians see this life as a pilgrimage journeying towards where we are supposed to be. Sometimes with Amazon two-day shipping, sometimes with creature comforts, with Whole Foods that's able to provide produce from everywhere in the world, I can get exactly what I crave when I want it, we forget that wherever we are is not our home. But so heaven is for us. We are here in Italy. We're here in this country that refuses to put progress over people. It refuses to put efficiency over a lengthy lunch. And there's something really beautiful for that. Maybe it's a little frustrating with train schedules and getting your bags here on time. And yet there's a genius to saying the interpersonal face-to-face is more important than unlimited texting. And so here in this country, yet another statement is being made by your wedding happening here. And yet further, Assisi, this town renowned as a place of peace, baptized by the prayers and sacrifices of St. Francis and St. Clair, who looked like total and utter, utter fools to the world. and yet began to see things the way that God sees them, and formed a community not built upon money or power or political anything, but on faith, hope, and love, love which never fails. Many who come to the city remark how peaceful it is, But peace is only a fruit. You cannot sow peace. Peace is a fruit of docility, teachability to the ways of God. And just as St. Francis and St. Clair and St. Agnes, St. Clair's biological sister, St. Rufino and Bernardino, the whole initial community of the Franciscans 
who preferred the ways of God to the ways of the world, they baptized this land by their sacrifices. Even this very church in which we stand was first inhabited here by a Benedictine community in the year 970. The very land on which we are standing and sitting and kneeling and praying has been washed in prayer by those preferring wisdom, the ways of God over every other way for over a millennium. What a beautiful preparation that we have here. This church is from 1253, that crucifix, the sign of the sacrificial love of Christ poured out by his precious blood, is from the 1400s, carved by an anonymous artist. Everything here redounds to a way that's living different than the ways that we are used to. In Europe, in Italy, in Assisi, within this Catholic monastery, Benedictine monastery, even at the altar, is the patron of Assisi, San Vittorino, the second bishop of this city, who was martyred for the faith. Everything here, by the Italian customs, to the prayers that have been prayed in this place, invite us into a new way of living that quite frankly is really good for us Americans. To put things into perspective, where is my life aiming at? A final chapter of thought for you is this. Oftentimes, our names mean something very beautiful. My own name, Daniel, Daniel, in Hebrew means God alone is my judge. And in looking at our names, they speak something, either about who we are or who we are called to be. I think in your particular case, as I've been praying through the many circumstances of this wedding, this marriage, I think your names speak something of each other as well as yourselves. Alan's middle name is August, and something that is august is impressive and by its nature demanding respect. And in many ways, Percy, your compassion, your organization, your openness to experiencing new things, yeah, let's get married in Europe, and your readiness to serve your clients, your friends, even those who are partially annoying, is something that is august in your character, something that demands a great respect. And Alan, your journey to this altar has been one that has required very much perseverance and persistence in your life your own walking in the ways of truth in search of wisdom in an 11 inch pilgrimage that takes an entire lifetime. This pilgrimage from one's head to one's heart. This is a pilgrimage that all of us must walk. And while we can have traveling companions, no one can do the pilgrimage for us. In many ways, Alan, your own journey here has required this perseverance, this persistence of will to continue despite obstacles. And after you walk down this aisle, you will have said to God Almighty himself that you will continue to walk this pilgrimage towards heaven by way of the heart and in intellect and truth and wisdom with a new persistence with Percy. And saying that she, being your traveling companion, you guiding each other along the way, will continue to walk day by day 
with the understanding that no place here is your home, but your home in heaven. With the understanding that you are not to put progress over people. With the understanding that you are to baptize your own home with prayer, so that it may be a house of peace for your children and for all whom you love. And that your life of faith, hope, and love, the greatest of which is love, will bring you to the life of heaven if you let God's love wash over you.